All right, okay everybody, we're gonna start. Welcome to uh, my talk on testing applications with VirtualBox. This talk uh, actually came about, I, I came from a, a Java developer background and I moved over to OpenSolaris and I had a lot of contacts with uh, Java user groups and uh, they wanted me to come speak and he said, well, there's gotta be some cool, you know, way to use OpenSolaris and VirtualBox for testing Java, which runs everywhere, right? And I said, yeah. Um, and so I, I, I put this talk together and I think it's pretty interesting. I hope you like it. Uh, for the folks on the web, this is session uh, 303951 and um, the session title is Testing Applications with VirtualBox. It's starting at 1.40 p.m. and this is room 305. So as I sort of said, the, sort of the goal of the next 50 minutes is to show you how you could use VirtualBox. Now how many of you are using VirtualBox already in this room? All right, so most of you are not yet, is that fair to say? Um, okay, cool, I think, are you using other virtualization software at the moment, anybody? So I have an opening question for you all in the audience. Um, who can tell me what this acronym stands for? You can take a guess. I yeah, right ones, test everywhere, way in the back, and I'm gonna try not to take out the soundboard. <laughs> well, I'd be better, I was, I was really concerned about wiping out the sound guys, yeah. Right, right once, test everywhere, and uh, you know, as I mentioned when I opened, Java is right once, run anywhere. But if you're really gonna deploy a Java application um, to anything other than the, op the actual operating system which you're developing it on, uh, you certainly wanna test it as ma on many operating systems as you expect it to be running on. And, and traditionally that can be a little difficult because you need all that hardware for all those different operating systems. And so here's you know, our poor developer, sort of frustrated. Um, and you know, I'm gonna begin my talk actually with doing application development. So before we get to testing, really quickly I wanna introduce OpenSolaris as a platform for actually doing, you know, developing Java applications and why does it make a good platform for that. And so just briefly I'm gonna do an introduction to application development just to get the ball rolling and we will spend the bulk of the time talking about testing. So as a developer, you know, how many of you are developers in here? Oh, perfect, good. So, uh, and you mostly know Java, does anyone not know Java? It's no big deal if you don't, I'm not, it's not a Java class, but I, I had somebody, I gave this presentation once before and somebody walked in and saw me coding in Java and they got all confused. But um, as a developer, you know, these are, you probably recognize all these, um, all these symbols, all these logos, you know, these are sort of the common things, a sampling of the common things you use as a developer. And so what we've done, you know, you're all familiar with the concept of LAMP, I'm sure, the Linux, Apache, MySQL, and then PHP, Perl, and Python. And so what we wanted to do for OpenSolaris is provide you the equivalent, or what, you know, we've called SAMP, which is just replacing the L with the S. But we've basically created a package called the Sun Web Stack. And so it includes all this software, you know, that, um, you know, you would most likely go and download individually, configure to work together, and it, we set it up so it's just a single install and it's all configured, ready to go. And there's even some, you know, the stuff I have at the top there is sort of the main stuff you get. And then it's very easy to add, you know, through our packaging system in OpenSolaris, additional components, like if you want to use the Django web framework or, you know, the Drupal content management system. That's again a single click to say, hey, package, install, Drupal, and then it's amazing. It's up and running and you can start playing with it. So as I mentioned, it's a single, there's the command to install it from the command line. Now there's also a GUI you can go into. So the, the package you would search for is amp-dev. Um, and so you'd run that and when you're done, you basically get um, you know, this developer tools menu and you've got the web stack and you've got some basic UI in here and you can start and stop some servers. And so just quickly what I would, thought I'd do at this point is just kind of show you a quick tor tutorial. And again, I don't want to emphasize the developing part of this presentation, but I kind of get blown away by today's IDEs and how easy 
They make it, most of you use what, Eclipse in here, NetBeans, you're familiar with both of those, I assume, but how easy they make it to build applications today. It's just kind of point and click, and you've got something up and running. And so to sort of, you know, just use that as an example, the only thing I did in advance for this talk is I created a simple database called StatusDB. And so, you know, we, most of us have managers, and our managers like to know what we do with our time. And so I, um, it's very simple, it has two tables. Uh, by the way, I don't know if I introduced myself, my name is Brian Leonard, uh, and my actual job is to evangelize Open Solaris, so I, I, I go around talking about how cool it is. But, so I put a table of uh, what I call evangelists, and I can, you know, view that data quickly, and that is here somewhere. There we go. And so there's a handful of us there. And, and then, of course, there's a foreign table uh, or a, a related table, a foreign key relationship, that has our status for what the various evangelists do. And so the, the idea is let's quickly build an application that my team of, it's not a big team, five or so of us, can use to you know, enter and manage our status. And so I'm going to create a new project in NetBeans. I can create, you know, we have this thing called a Java desktop application. And I'll select database application, we'll call it, oop. That's fine, that's fine. Oh, sorry, so it says, okay, I, I decided I wanna build a data, database application, so it shows me the list of databases that I have kind of configured connections to in NetBeans, and here's our status DB. So it found my evangelist table. So I'm just gonna select all those fields. Now it will also let me create sort of a master detail sort of application. So because of the foreign key relationship, it found my status table. So I'm just gonna again go with all those fields and click finish. Now it's gonna crank away here for you know, a couple of seconds and it's actually generating a full blown uh, JPA standard swing application. And so uh, it's going to wrap up here in a second, and I can simply click run, and it should compile, and we should display an application in a second. And, and here you go. And so we have, I can click on you know, the evangelist, and I can see the various statuses, and I can add new details and edit them and so on and so forth. So the point is, at this point, we're going to decide I'm happy with this application, and I want to take it and decide how I'm going to distribute it to my team. So let's use Java Web Start. That's a good, that's a good technology for distributing Swing applications. And so, again, the tool makes it very easy to do this. I can just select the properties, and it has this, you know, Web Start category, and I can just like, hey, let's enable Web Start. And then, um, you have to, uh, you know, when you deploy over the web, the, the jars do need to be signed for sort of testing purposes. I can just self-sign them, um, and that's fine. And so I'll click OK. And so now let's run this again and see what happens. And this time you'll notice that it's actually compiling all the jars. It's signing them for me. And then you're going to see something you should all be somewhat familiar with, which, which is the web start interface. So rather than it just running, it's actually going through simulating the download and launching the app. Yeah, this is common. Do you trust, do you trust this publisher? And there we go. We're up and running. So now at this point, everything's from within NetBeans. And before my team can use it, I need to kind of figure out how to get it out of NetBeans and get it onto a web server somewhere. Well, one of the components in the sub web, st web stack is the Apache web server. And so simply what I can do is, well, let's back up a second. So the Apache web server has an H, uh, H, uh, a docs directory. And so what I've done, I like working within the IDE, um, and so it has this concept of favorites, which are just pointers to directories of interest to me. And one of the, the favorites I set up was the HT docs directory of my Apache instance that got installed as part of the Sun web stack. So theoretically, what I can do at this point is take the jar files from this swing application I just built, and including the JNLP file that was created for me, that's the web start file, and drop them into my Apache directory here. So let's do that. 
So here's my project, employee status. There's the distribution directory. And I'm just going to copy these five items from here and over to favorites. And I'm going to paste them <coughs> here. All right. And so let's go ahead and launch a browser now. Okay. And first of all, let's just hit localhost to make sure Apache's up and running. And that's Apache's <laughs> indicator to you that I am up and running. I didn't code that. That's exactly how it comes. And so, so there were two files. Uh, well, there were five files, but one of them was a launch.html page. And so there it is. And it's basically, again, you know, certainly you would make this look a little bit nicer, but for the purposes of testing, it's fine. And it has ability to launch the application, which is the JNLP file. Or the, it's basically going to load the JNLP file. Maybe you can see that down in the status down there. So my first question to you, does, does people think this is going to work? Is it that simple? If I say so. <laughs> well, let's find out. So I'll click the link. And that's not what I was hoping to see. So what's the problem? What's our first problem? Yeah, exactly, the MIME type. And so that's, unfortunately, Apache does not ship with uh, the JNLP MIME type defined. And so let's go back. OK, well, let's look at a few things first. So let's actually look at these developer tools. And there is this web stack admin. And there's this kind of nice options dialog I can bring up here. It's pretty basic, but it does some basic things for me. Um, and so it shows me there's my uh, documents directory that I mapped to my favorites and the port I'm running on, the default 80, of course. Uh, and it's got this advanced configuration option. And uh, when we click this, you know, we get a text editor, so that's OK. But if I scroll down, I see where my MIME types are. They're in a, um, you know, Etsy Apache 2.2 MIME types. So let's uh, open up a terminal and just go there really quick. And for purposes of this presentation, I did pre-add it. I didn't want to mistype this. But it is not there by default. And so that's the MIME type definition for JNLP. So we'll save that. I will leave that open. And so we'll come back to the web browser. Now this, generate, this sometimes takes a few kicks to get it to actually recognize the Oh, no, what do I need to do? Duh, I need to restart the server. Um, OK. That's the only way it's going to pick up that new MIME type. So let's come back here. So I can stop the servers from here. And this is using a feature in uh, OpenSolaris called SMF for the service management framework. I'm not going to get into that. I don't have time to get into that. But it's a really nice way of managing your system services. And then I can start those servers again. OK, and as part of that starting, it actually loaded the web page to prove to me that it's up and running. So now that that's done, let's just try this again. And then oh, what's going on? Uh, what did I do? So I hate when things go wrong that aren't supposed to go wrong. That looks good. There we go. So it took a second. So even though, um, and I could, I could go back, and we'll see it later. I'm going to do this some more. Um, but it did finally recognize the MIME type. So at this point, it wants to open that file using Java Web Start. And I click OK. And it's going to run. And it's going to sort of go through the process of downloading the application. And hopefully, 
in a second here, we'll be up and running, and there we are. And so now I'm feeling a little bit better. I've actually got it outside of the tool, I've got it deployed to a web server, and I've got it up and running. And so, you know, could I, should I give you guys my IP address at this point in, in the audience and say, here, run this app, do we think it's gonna work? Or maybe we should do some additional testing on my end before I irritate you with, you know, potential additional problems. And so with that, let me actually go back to the presentation really quick and introduce the application testing component of my talk. And so to start out, I want to introduce VirtualBox. A handful of you were familiar with it. A lot of you weren't, and that's good because, um, well, I want you to be familiar with it, so I don't want to bore you. But it, essentially, if... It, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a tool for running other operating systems on your operating system. And so whether that is Mac OS, Solaris, um, Windows, or Linux as your host operating system that you're running on the bare metal, you can install VirtualBox, and then you can create what we call guest operating systems. And so, you know, those can be a whole host of things. You can have OS2 and, you know, DOS and, you know, whatever kind of wacky thing you need to test there's a good chance there's a guest, it supports that guest. Um, and so just a little bit of history on this software. Back uh, eight years ago, um, there was a product called Connectix Virtual PC that was ported to Windows. That was a, micro, uh, a Macintosh product. And then once it was ported, Microsoft actually acquired the rights to that product from Inatech. And so Inatech took all that money and they said, well, we're gonna start from scratch. And they created this project called VirtualBox and this was about five years ago. And then they open sourced it just two years ago and then we acquired them last year. And I remember when we acquired them and I thought, you know, I, I had a Mac at the time and I was using uh, Parallels, which is a common Mac alternative to this, or it may, many of you may be familiar with uh, VMware's product. Both of those you need to pay for. I mean, they're not ridiculously expensive, but they're not free, and I thought, you know, virtualization doesn't seem like an easy thing to do to me. Um, I, I, was, I was really skeptical about an open source solution, that I, especially one that I'd never heard of, but I tried it, and uh, I've been using it now solidly for well over a year. It's a really solid product, and as I mentioned, it's open source and it's free. So, um, you know, some of the capabilities it has, as I already mentioned, the platform support, uh, you can, you know, you basically run a whole other operating system in a window. You can resize that window. It has full screen mode, so you'll forget you're in a virtual. I do this all the time. I'm in my virtual instance of whatever, and I forget I'm there. I shut it down, and I'm still in a virtual. I'm still in an operating system. I get confused. Um, a seamless Windows, and so you can actually have like a, you know, a Windows window right next to a Mac OS window, uh, compare and contrast them. The mouse move seamlessly in and out of the, of the, from the guest to the host. So it's a, I, I can tell you it's frustrating when your mouse gets locked into the guest and you have to like unlock it to get out of there. Um, ability to copy and paste between the guest and the host is really nice. I'll, do, I'll show you some of that today. The save state feature, this is like putting your guest operating system into hibernation. So I can tell it that it's rather than shut down, just wherever you're, whatever you're doing right now, just save that. And when I watch you again later, I will come back and restore you. Um, and there's a superb, because it is an open source product, there's an excellent community around it. One of the sites I put there is a blog at wordpress.com. And they have lots of images, and I mean hundreds of images, ready to roll. So if you want, you know, Ubuntu already packaged with Glassfish and a whole bunch of other stuff, I guarantee you that image is there. So you don't have to create it. You can just download it and don't have to worry about installing and hit the ground running. And so let me give you a quick demo of VirtualBox. So when you install it, it will be in the, let's see, system tools. All right, so here's my personal VirtualBox. This is my day-to-day -day laptop. And you see I've got, what, eight different machines at least configured, and, and I use them for various things. And um, you'll notice that four of those are actually Open Solaris. And that's kind of interesting, because Open Solaris is my bare metal operating system. It is my host as well. But whenever I want to try something, you know, this is my day-to-day -day laptop. I don't want to, I just don't want to screw it up. And so if I want to try something, I will oftentimes do it in a virtual machine so that uh, if it does screw things up, I don't care. I can just, I'm, I trash it and I'm done. 
it's also a great, you know, this, this whole talk is about testing. And I'll tell you right now, with a tool like VirtualBox, whenever I file a bug report now, I no longer am concerned that it's something to do with my setup. I can actually create the machine in VirtualBox, a clean new version, say it's Windows, and I can actually, you know, try to do whatever I'm doing and recreate that bug, and I can explain that in the bug report for whatever product it is. I can say, look, I, you know, created a brand new instance of Windows, I did this, it's clean, because as a developer, I have learned, and I'm sure you've all been there as well, that your machines become, they become friendly to you. I mean, you set some configuration, you know, some environment variable or some configuration setting in a file somewhere that you forgot about, but it actually allowed whatever you were working on to work, and then you go to deploy it and you're scratching your head why it doesn't, you forgot about that setting you made. So it's also a great resource for, uh, for that kind of testing. And so just real quickly, you know, the way it works, if you want to create a machine, um, you know, you hit the, it's pretty straightforward, you hit the new button, you give it a name, you know, let's say, we're gonna try out the new open Solaris. Here's all the operating systems that are supported. You see the list here, and so, and then there's a subversion, so we can pick open Solaris. Now, your machine has, I have three gigs of memory on my machine. Some portion of that you wanna allocate to the virtual machine. That can be anywhere from 512 to up to four gig if you have that much available. And then it wants a file to basically be your virtual hard disk for this machine. And at this point, this is where if you downloaded one from like that website I gave you, you would just point to that. And they're big, it's like a three gig file. So you, you have to give it some time to download. But alternatively, you can just create one from scratch. There's a couple options. Um, you can, the second option, fixed size storage, you can say, you know what? I don't want this file to be, I want it to be 20 gigabytes, and I don't want it to be any bigger than that, and it'll create a 20 gigabyte file. I never use that option. Uh, it's supposed to be more performant than the dynamically expanding storage, but this will literally create a file that's only a couple hundred megabytes. And that's why I'm able to have eight virtual machines, because they're not consuming, you know, some of those, I have some of those disks set to 64 gigs. I guarantee you they're not using that much space. Um, but they can grow that large if they need to, and I just find comfort in that. So, like, yeah, so like I said, you know, I can set this to 76 gigabytes, um, and then I'm finished. And, well, now, you know, basically I walk through the wizard, and it's ready to go. Now, my disk is empty at this point. There's, no oper there's actually no operating system there. I need to install it. And if I go to start this machine, it's actually smart enough to recognize that there's no operating system there. It's the first time you're running this machine. What do you want to do? Do you have a CD or a DVD or, you know, is there some other media source? And a great way is to just download the ISO files. And you see I've done a bunch of those. And so one of those I have here is, you know, like I was actually playing around with Solaris 10. I wanted to compare it to Open Solaris. And then you kind of just set that. And then you finish, and it actually goes and starts loading that operating system or running through the installer or whatever. And when it's done, you have a new operating system in VirtualBox. So it's pretty straightforward. I'm actually not going to do this now, so I'll cancel. And I'll close this down. OK, so let's go back to our presentation briefly. Now, one of the reasons I like to use Open Solaris as my presentation, as my um, development environment is, in addition to things like the web stack, which I've introduced, the SMS service framework, which I showed you briefly for starting and stopping the services, is the file system, ZFS. And there's been talks already today. There's some deep dives tomorrow that are free that will go into depth on this. I certainly don't have time to give it any sort of justice in this presentation. But one of the features I really like about it is the snapshotting capability. So it allows me, it's very efficient, very lightweight, allows me to take a picture of some data set on my desktop. And so VirtualBox, this is a, a picture of a configuration file from VirtualBox. It stores all of its machine data in a hidden directory off of my, and of course you can, you can see you can change these, but the default is a hidden directory off of your home directory. And so what I thought I would do is, well from a testing standpoint, let me take a snapshot of my VirtualBox environment, that way when I do my testing, I can do whatever I want in those machines, and then when I'm done, 
I can roll back to my snapshot and start over again. And I don't have to worry about working in that polluted environment. It never gets friendly. It always stays pristine. So as an example of what I'm talking about, let's go back over here. Let me clean up some stuff. Oh, I want that terminal. OK, so you see I have, well, now nine machines. I just created that new one, right? And most of them are in the save state. There's a couple that are powered off, certainly the new one I just created. So I'm going to close down VirtualBox. I'm going to open up a terminal. And I'm going to run this sort of ZFS list command. It's going to show me, among, among other things, the snapshots that I have. And the way these snapshots work is that this, I, know, I, I hate looking at output like this because I know it's kind of confusing, but um, you see it starting at the top to about three quarters of the way down, there's all these R pools and then VBox. That's a data set that I define for VirtualBox. And then the snapshots are what you see after the at symbol. And so I have, you see five through 11. And that's just as time has gone on, I've decided that, oh, there's another change I want to make cool. There's another change that I want to make to my test environment. And so what I do is I roll back to the last good snapshot, make that change. And so a lot of times I'll put a little comment in there about what I did. Like, I, like the last one I did, I just installed JavaFX. And I wanted to capture that, so that's always there. And I created a snapshot. And so what I'm going to do is roll back to um, that data set, that snapshot. And that's essentially the command, ZFS, rollback, and then the snapshot name. And I think I typed it right. I hit Enter. And now, you see, I'll start VirtualBox. And boom, everything. Well, there's a new version of VirtualBox available that I need to upgrade to, but that's OK. So you see, I'm back to my original eight. The one I just created in front of you is history. And even one that was powered off before, the one that's highlighted, actually, is now in a saved state. Um, so yes. Good question, yes. So the question was, um, VirtualBox has its own snapshotting capability. And you can actually take, you see there's a tab there for snapshots, and you can take snapshots of your machines. I have used them both in tandem. The difference with my approach is that I'm taking a snapshot of in my entire VirtualBox world. You could certainly set up each machine in its own ZFS data set and do it through ZFS. I have compared, and the ZFS approach is much more efficient than the VirtualBox approach. So if you care about disk space, that's one reason. Um, but the other reason I like it is sort of that global snapshotting capability. And, and that's a personal preference. Other people told me I like to take individual snapshots of my machine. And I've actually tried to use both. You can use both in tandem. There's no reason why I can't now take a snapshot within my ZFS snapshot um, and manage it that way if you want to, uh, if you can manage all that. OK, so, uh, so that introduces VirtualBox, again, briefly. Now, the point is, I've, I've created this application, and I want to test it in, a, in sort of other environments. And so let's start up like Windows XP. So it's in a save state. Hopefully, it'll start up, like, again, coming out of hibernation. And that's not too bad. And I actually then, I have separate desktops in OpenSolaris, so I actually named this one Windows, which is over here. Now watch, I can put this in full screen mode. And you probably didn't expect to see this at OpenSolaris Day, but I could have given my entire presentation in Microsoft Windows. But the point is, you would have no idea there was OpenSolaris underneath the covers. And it's very performant. Um, and so let's actually start Internet Explorer. Now, the one thing I do need to do, let me get out of this. Hey, there's Susan Boyle. And let me go back. And I just need to grab my IP address, because now I'm doing you know, sort of networking. So it's 172.26.0.35. And we'll go back to Windows.
that's what's going on. Is that it? Oh, it's 26, right? There we go. No one, none of you saw that? You just let me sweat up here? All right, so there it is, it works. And uh, that's actually hitting the Apache server running on open Solaris. So the real question, so that's, so that's just a quick test of Apache working. So the real question is, let's do now launch. All right, now the real test, is this gonna work? We, it worked locally. All right, good, there's it's loading. You see the JNLP issue has resolved itself. That was just a caching issue. So, um, hmm, okay, trouble. So we can fortunately look at the details here and we can see sort of up here, I don't know if you can see it back in the room there, but it's definitely referencing some temp, you know, employ something or other. And that's in the JNLP file. And so let's actually go back to NetBeans and I don't really need this anymore. All right, and here's the problem. It's this code base, you know, where it's expecting to find the code. And that certainly isn't gonna work over the network. And so let's, uh, 172, 26. Now certainly, you know, if, if a DNS was set up properly and everything, I, that would be a host name. Uh, probably more ideally than an IP address, but for our purposes, this should work fine. So I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna revert back to Windows and try this again. Uh, again, this might be a caching issue. Let me try it one more time. Okay, good. So this looks better. It's actually downloading the jar files for the application. So that's progress. Now we've got the, you know, do you approve of this app signed by Sun Microsystems? Yes. So now what? You know, nothing. At least I got an error message before. What do I do at this point? Anybody? What's that? Yeah, so how do I troubleshoot it, though? How do I, what would you recommend I troubleshoot this problem? Any ideas? Who said that? You did, here, you get a t-shirt for that. Okay, I'll take out the camera. So yeah, the Java console, and so let's, again, you have to think like you're working in an actual, on a totally different, like this could be a Windows machine sitting over here, it behaves identical to that, and so I'm gonna open up the control panel and in there is the Java console, so I can start, or the Java configurator, or the control panel. Let's open this. Man, these are running really slow. Um, yeah, and under advanced, I'm sorry, and there's a, the Java console, and I can show the console. All right, and then we'll close this. And we'll try this one more time. This doesn't need to be so big. Okay, there we go. So now the console's popped up. And you notice it didn't have to download the app again. It hasn't changed. Okay, ah, there we go. So some sort of secret exception happened. And we grow up, and I think someone said the database connection, right? Um, and you're right on. If we look through this, you know, Oracle Toplink Essentials, that's, it's using the um, Oracle JPA uh, service provider. And so, yeah, and so let's go back to NetBeans. And this time, if we look at the actual project, there's a file called persistence.xml. 
and that's not really the point of this presentation. It's just that the types of issues, you know, there are issues we'll run into. You know, there's nothing fancy I'm trying to do here. I'm just trying to deploy a web start app using an app built by, you know, an IDE. But if we look in here, we see that the, this is just connection information for my database and the configuration file. And you see that the, the URL that it's pointing to, again, is localhost. And another title I use for this presentation is called Developing Beyond Localhost because this localhost just sort of, you know, bites you when you go to deploy. And so um, I'll put the IP address in here. And save. Now, unfortunately, because this is actually part of the app, I do need to sort of build, and it's going to rebuild that one jar file and re-sign it, just the employee status. And so I'm going to copy that jar file, and we'll go to favorites, and we'll delete it. We'll delete the old one and paste the new one. Okay. Now, go back to Windows, close, launch. Now, it should download that one jar file, right? That's all about what Web Start's all about. It detects changes to the application underneath here. It's downloading it, the console's starting up. I, should, I could say yes, I'll always accept, so I don't have to see that again. Oh, man, we're still not out of the woods yet, so now what's the problem? Um, Okay, we've got this access denied for user root, right? And so I don't know how many of you know MySQL, but, or my, I'm sorry, MySQL. It's uh, the root user, at least in my experience, isn't configured to work over the network. And uh, so, again, that's sort of like the default user developers use. So let's go back one more time, at least, to our application. And I have already created a user for this data called ev, and the password is ev. So I'm going to set this in my configuration file. And we will um, build this one more time. All right. Copy, favorites, delete. Alrighty. So it should download our jar again. Ah, voila, we made it. <laughs> so again, the real point there is not so much that those specific problems is what I'm trying to teach you how to address, this that I, there's a good chance there will be problems. And there were a lot of them that once I went off my machine, if, if I had just told you, hey, hit my, you know, that IP address I wrote down, I don't know if you are on the same subnet here, but if you could hit it, you should be able to launch this app as well now. I'd feel more comfortable about that. And so just as a final test, just to be sure, you know, I know some people are using Linux, I could, come back and go to VirtualBox and let's start my, I have an Ubuntu here, let's start this up. All right, so I'm going to put this. I have a desktop for a workspace for Ubuntu. We'll come over here. Again, I can go full screen, and then we can launch Firefox. That's not what I wanted to do. Okay. 
And at this point, I'm probably pretty confident this will work. I mean, all the issues I hit were networking issues, but we can at least get a feel for you know how it behaves on Linux, um, so on and so forth. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a little different. You get a couple different dialogues. This is Firefox, of course, instead of IE. And there we go. So now I'm really pretty confident. I've tried two different operating systems. You know, if, if you're using another variant of Linux or another variant of Windows, I'm, it's probably going to work. So I'm, I'm pretty happy. So, so you say, you've seen the networking there. I've been sort of, my host is Open Solaris that I've been pulling from it. What about the other way around? What if I wanted, I know that my application is going to be multi tiered. I'm going to have uh, an application server running in the data center on, say, Ubuntu. Um, how would I, how could I work with that? And so let's see if we have anything running here. I'm going to do, yeah, I do. Glassfish is running on Ubuntu, right? I type in localhost and that's kind of cool. I never even started Glassfish, but when I saved the machine, Glassfish was running. And so when I restored the machine, Glassfish is still running. So that's, I find that kind of nice as well. And so let's now take the IP address of, of this guy. Let's uh, 0 0.61. And Let's say I want to deploy an application to Ubuntu, just like it was in my data center. So NetBeans has a nice feature where I can actually set up remote servers. And so I'm going to choose to add a server. And I'm going to add Glassfish. Um, I'll call it Ubuntu, because that's where it resides. And it's going to be my, a remote domain. It's not locally on my machine. And so the host where it resides and it is uh, 172. Okay, so now if everything goes well, we should see a little green arrow appear, and we did. And so it actually has detected that Glassfish is up and running on Ubuntu in my virtual box. And so at this point, what I've done is um, I, I was trying to think of good scenarios for testing applications. Uh, you know, what, what kind of applications need some testing on cross-platform from a look and feel standpoint? And certainly applications that use Ajax. I mean, you kind of never know how that stuff's going to work. And so uh, the, there's a um, pro Ajax book has some sample projects in it. Uh, for that actually come ready to run in NetBeans. And so I just downloaded those. And so actually, let's reconfigure some of these. I'm going to open up the properties for these two projects called Chapter. And I'm going to set their runtime server from the local version of Glassfish on my machine to this new instance that's on Ubuntu. And I'm going to do it for both of these. All right, now I'm just going to click Run. And at this point, it's building the application, and it's going to but it's deploying it to Ubuntu, which happens to just be in a virtual machine instead of a data center somewhere. Oh, well, that's not, <laughs> that's not, OK, my bad. Let me cancel this. Uh, let me, I can either set this, the problem is I click the Run button, and this is not the main project, so I'm just going to run it from, well, we can set it as the main project, either or, or we can run it from here. There we go. That's better. Yeah, so it's compiling the app, and then it's going to deploy it remotely to Ubuntu. And then it should start up the browser with the application running remotely. There 
we go. And then, so for example, uh, autocomplete is a very popular Ajax solution. You see the IP address up here, right? It's not using localhost, of course, because it's not talking to the local server. And, you know, I can start to do the autocomplete. And say I want to compare and contrast how that looks on different operating systems. And so at this point, I can simply, let's just copy this entire URL. And let's go into Ubuntu. And I'm going to paste it. And I could hit enter, and we can see how it looks here. Of course, I could replace that IP address with localhost, because now I am on the local system. But how about from Windows, right? So now, how about from virtual machine to virtual machine? Can I, from within the Windows virtual machine, hit the Ubuntu virtual machine to test out how this looks? And so let's see how that works. Yep, I can, and then, of course, we can see that. And you see, it looks a little bit different there, of course, right? In Internet Explorer, it's like offset a little bit. Um, you know, and you can try other things like Google's Chrome only runs in Windows, at least as far as I know. I don't, maybe they ported it to Linux. I don't really know. But if I wanted to see how it behaved in Chrome, um, I could do that. Or if you know, Chrome's just something you wanted to play around with because you heard about it and didn't have Windows, VirtualBox is a great way to do that. Now, I, th this question comes up every now and then. You know, Windows obviously is not open source software. It's not free. Uh, you do not get a free version of Windows with VirtualBox. I mean, it's up to you to supply the copy of Windows that you're going to install in VirtualBox. But let's uh, paste, run, and then autocomplete. Okay, so I see how that looks there. So let's just do another quick example and then I'll, you know, pretty much wrap up and take some questions. So let's go back to NetBeans and I just want to do this chapter 3, so I'm going to run this one. And this has an effect called um, effect parallel that I thought was kind of cool. Oops. Copy that. OK. So I'm going to run this. And uh, this is doing two things at once of parallel effects. So it's moving and it was changing colors. And so you may want to use that. Uh, before you do, maybe you want to test it out on other operating systems. It worked okay in Firefox and Open Solaris. Let's try it on uh, Ubuntu and Firefox. Oh, I gotta grab. Yep, it works, and not a real big surprise because. Um, it's still Firefox. Let's go over to Windows. Try it in Chrome since that's what we have up. Uh, what did I do? There we go. Uh, okay, hold on. Let me grab that again. There we go. All right, it kind of works, a little, little dodgy, but it works. And then finally in IE, no one's surprised that it doesn't work in IE. <laughs> OK, so again, silly example just to the point of the value of VirtualBox. So with that, on that note, um, I'll come back to my Prezo really quick. And, uh, oh, I only have a couple minutes left. Uh, a couple minutes for questions. Yeah, so that basically wraps it up. If you have some questions, I, yes, shoot. One. There's, it's, a, it's a laptop. It's got one. How many, the question was how many network cards do I have? I have one. It's a single NIC. <laughs> oh, it, ha it uses its own bridge network adapter that, yes, yes. 
Well, so, no. So another cool technology is with Open Source 2906 is Crossbow, where you can create virtual NICs. And so I'm looking forward to playing around with that, where I could create my own virtual NICs. And I, I don't have an experience with it enough to actually comment on it, other than it should be doable. Um, well, it's there. It's yeah. I just haven't experimented with, but it, it, you should be able to do that today. Yeah. Yep, I gotta wrap up, guys. I'm sorry. I meant to leave more time for questions. Uh, I am giving a talk next about moving to Open Solaris. If you're not using it yet and you want some assistance on how to use it, just right over there. Um, if you are using it, congratulations um, and thank you for your attention.